from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming out to the National Book Festival, which is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the thinking person's amusement park. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to introduce a writer who is also a self-made phenomenon. In publishing parlance, there is the term ATM, and I don't mean the little machine on the wall, although the acronym has a lot to do with money. To publishers, ATM means after Terry McMillan. <laughs> after a moment in publishing history when Terry McMillan proved everyone wrong and established once and for all that there is a huge market of readers for black American fiction, and more specifically, black American fiction written for, by, and about women. That moment in publishing history was the publication of her novel, Waiting to Scale, right. It was the story of four educated African American women living in Phoenix, Arizona, who have an ongoing conversation about their heartaches in finding and keeping lovers and about the dearth of available black men. From that point in time, that was 1992, Macmillan has been pulling her readers along in a swift, happy trajectory following the private life of her characters in many successful novels such as Disappearing Act, A Day Late and A Dollar Short, How Stella Got Her Groove Back, The Interruption of Everything, and now the long-awaited sequel to Waiting to Exhale, the brand new Getting to Happy. Terry McMillan started out as a smart, talented kid in Port Huron, Michigan in the 1970s. She worked her way, all right, she worked her way through a community college in California, transferred to UC Berkeley, was encouraged by her professor, Ishmael Reed, and then as a single mother in the mid-1980s, working every kind of odd job she could find to support her son, she began to write her first novel. In the wee early morning hours before work, before taking her son to school, before or wherever she could, on the train, in uh, the kitchen. The book was called Mama. And its first sentence went something like this. Mildred hid the axe beneath the mattress of the cot in the dining room. In that one sentence, you learn so much. You know Mildred. The cot in the dining room su suggests a little dislocation. You get the sense of dread, the tension. You want to keep on reading. When Terry McMillan was asked why she started the book that way, she said, do I look like a person who beats around the bush? But success didn't come right away to Terry McMillan. Before ATM, African-American writers like her were forced to do just that, beat around the bush. The late great literary agent and editor at Random House, Manny Barron, used to complain that publishers were too slow to understand the African-American market. The adage, right up to 1992, was black people don't read. Publishers said it in boardroom meetings. Editors said it to literary agents. Literary agents, in turn, said it to struggling authors. The conventional wisdom was that a black writer shouldn't waste his or her time. Black people wouldn't buy books. Or if one book by an African American did happen to make it through to the public consciousness, it was a fluke, not a trend. All that changed with this writer you're about to hear. I look at Terry McMillan as being the godhead of contemporary black fiction, Barron said. When one book after another hit the bestseller list and sold in millions, when they went on to become movies and icons in the popular imagination, it was a wake-up call. Here, ladies and gentlemen, to talk to you about her new book, Getting to Happy, is a writer who transformed an industry and has kept a huge population of people happily reading her over the years, the godhead of contemporary black American fiction, Terry McMillan. Can I give you a hug? Let me give you a hug.
<laughs> wow, that was very thoughtful. I don't even know her. Can I turn, can you hear me? Thank you all for coming. This is a big audience. Wow. And I saw President Barack Obama last night. And I'm going to see Dr. King's memorial when I leave here. I live in San Francisco, and I am just really glad today is not raining, okay? Um, thank you all for being readers. And I was gonna pretend I was gonna drink off this bottle so you'd think it was vodka. <laughs> but it's called Fred, and it's spring water at the hotel I'm at. But I thought it would be really cool, but it's too warm. Anyway, um, I don't know if my publicist from my publishing company is in here. I ran into her. Megan, if you're in here, don't tell that I'm doing this, what I'm about to do. I'm not going to read from Getting to Happy, okay? I'm sick of that book. <laughs> but I am, I like to, I'm going to read a, kind of a rough draft of a, the opening of a new book that I'm working on. <laughs> don't get all worked up. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a draft, but it's always, to me, it's, I, I always used to, I used to love reading from a work in progress because if it, if it doesn't, if I don't hear it right, it doesn't work. And um, plus, you know, everybody doesn't think your baby is cute, <laughs> but... So I'm going to read this, and then I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And I don't want to be presumptuous in assuming that everybody read Getting to Happy. Um, it's okay. I liked it, but now I'm over them. Um, so this book is called Who Asked You? And it's a novel, and this is chapter... Sort of chapter one, okay, Doki? Can you hear me okay? How about right here? Okay. Before I had a chance to make other plans, I was married and had three kids. I'll be the first to admit that I could have been a better mother, and according to all these modern books on how to be a deluxe parent written by folks who've never been parents, apparently I made some major mistakes. For starters, I didn't always put my kids first, which seemed fair. I mean, I had needs too. Hell, back then, I felt just like a pie. Everybody wanted a piece of me and barely left me with a little crust. Back then, children didn't come with instructions, so I had to wing it. My mother has seven of us, and she made it look easy. Five of us went to college, me not being one of them. Well, I do count the culinary arts program I completed, which is how I worked my way up to becoming assistant room service manager at a major chain of four, but should really be three star hotel which will not be my problem in six months because i will be doing something i've been wanting to do for years which is called retiring anyway six of us turned out to be mentally balanced and decent human beings i think my older brother monroe is missing a few letters in his alphabet but thank god he lives somewhere in the boonies outside of new orleans but then there's my older sister jewel who thinks she's smarter than everybody else just because she got a master's degree in psychology from some rinky-dink college no one's ever heard of. And it should be obvious that there are a whole lot of unstable people who graduate from college, but you didn't hear from me. And Miss Know Every Damn Thing could sure stand to work on her verb and subject agreement, which she seems to have forgotten from fifth green back in Abilene, Texas, which is where we grew up. As much as I love her, I really cannot stand her. And if she weren't my sister, I would have kicked her to the curb about 45 years ago after she said to me, that hairstyle was not meant for you, Betty Jean. I think you'd look much better with short hair. And that little bitch took a pair of pinking shears and cut off seven inches of my hair. Maybe not, she said, after looking at her handiwork. I have not cared for her since. I try to avoid her at all costs, but it's impossible since she just had to follow me to Los Angeles back in the 80s and bought a house 13 minutes away. 
up there on Lamert Park where black folks with two-car garages, palm trees in their front and backyards, credit cards, and money in the bank live. Anyway, there's a reason why she's never been married, but that didn't stop her from having a baby, now did it? No, it did not. That baby is almost six feet tall and 32 years old and still lives with her. She treats him like he's 14, but you didn't hear it from me. I keep my mouth shut, even when my friends, especially my best friend Tammy, who lives across the street and happens to be white but thinks she's black, have been asking me to pass 14 years, tell me something, BJ, which is what I let people I like call me. When is Omar ever gonna give his mama that pacifier back and climb out of that bassinet and pull that 325i into his very own parking space? That's all I wanna know. <laughs> Not that I'm staying up all night worrying about it. Your guess is as good as mine is the best answer I could come up with because I wouldn't dream of asking Jewel who was, excuse me, who was quick to point out what everybody else is doing wrong but never bothers to turn that mirror on herself, which is why I don't even think about questioning anything she does or criticizing her because she can cut you into little pieces with her tongue. She and Tammy never get, got along because Tammy married a black man, which Jewel thinks makes her, made her a thief but it never bothered me. Anyway, if Tammy is over here when Jewel drops by, she looks through Tammy like she's clear. I try to avoid friction and don't like to argue or fight or raise my voice except maybe at the post office or standing in that long return line at Walmart or when I take my grandkids to the playground and Trinetta acts like she forgot what Clorox and lotion is for. Even though she denies it, we know Jewel called Child Protective Services on Trinetta. That time, little Noxzema drank some bubble bath and had to be rushed to emergency. Anyway, since I'm retrospecting, let me get back to my kids. 30 some odd years ago, I did not know, have what they call, what they now call an inside voice. I talked to them like they were hard of hearing. <laughs> it, it was the only way I could get their attention and to let them know I meant business. I didn't like being a repeater, saying the same damn thing over and over and over again and still not getting the results I was after. They were hard headed. And as hard as I tried not to, sometimes they made me swear. Although I did not swear at them or call them out of their name, Quentin, Dexter, and the baby, Trinetta. Once in a while, they did hear me say shit and damn it, oh hell no, and maybe once or three times the F word. Apparently this was supposed to ruin them, but I don't think this is what did it. <laughs> I also said no a lot because a lot of the things they asked for were unreasonable or ridiculous. Here we were living off Crenshaw in Washington and they walked to the, wanted to walk four blocks to the corner store. Play in the street, light sparklers, boil hot dogs. The Crips and the Bloods were just starting to branch out into our neighborhood and for years, for their, most of their childhood, I could not let them wear red or blue. I won't lie. If they disobeyed me, I popped their little behinds. I didn't beat them and never used any handheld items. Timeouts had not been invented yet, but I doubt if they'd have worked on my kids anyway. Like I said, they were hard-headed and liked pushing my buttons just to see what they could get away with. Oh, and I also did not want to be their friend. My friends were grown. We talked about things that grown, concerned grown folks, shared grown folks' secrets, stuff that was none of their business. Just the thought of confiding in my kids gives me the heebie-jeebies. What would I have told them? Say, kids, guess how long it's been since I've had satisfying sex with your daddy? <laughs> and more often than not, I can't stand him, and sometimes y'all too. <laughs> I don't think that would have been too cool. Plus, what kind of advice could someone who has never bought groceries give me? And which one of them could lend me $100? I should never have listened to Jewel because she was the one who suggested I marry Mr. Oldie. He's a good catch, Betty Jean, and he'll make you some pretty babies. Lee David was not a good catch. He was an easy catch. Although I wasn't homely or anything, I certainly would not qualify for third place as anybody's homecoming queen. But Lee David was very good looking. He was also 10 years older than me and way too excited about being a lifer at the UPS. He also, he turned out to be dull. Wasn't no more to him than met the eye. And the kids didn't turn out to be half as cute as everybody said they were. <laughs> he might as well have been one of the kids. He was just as needy and actually competed against them for my attention and affection. I think he won. 
but my clock was slow because it took about 20 years for me to realize I did not like being his wife. I was just too lazy to divorce him. Plus, you get used to men, just like you do a household pet. <laughs> Speaking of which, he's been in there sleeping while I've been out here reminiscing and seasoning chicken. Sometimes you need to take advantage of a few quiet minutes you have to add up what you've done with your life or what you haven't done, which is how I started out thinking about what kind of a mother I'd I've been, I give myself a C, maybe a C minus. I'll get to me after I eat. And thank God it's my day off. Even though sometimes I do less work at work, right now I'm standing in this kitchen in front of our big old electric stove, flicking a few drops of water into a skillet full of hot oil and watching the geyser splatter above it. A brown bag full of seasoned flour sitting on the counter. Chicken breasts and thighs are piled up on a floral platter. These are the only pieces Lee David likes. After 36 years of marriage, I forgot I used to love wings. I dip a few pieces in a bowl of whisked eggs, drop them inside the bag, shake them back and forth, and then place them into the skillet. I wash my hands in warm water and then start snapping string beans. It's too damn hot to be frying anything, but Lee David loves the smell, and his expectations aren't very high anymore. Even though the back door is open and the fan is sitting in front of it because the air conditioner is still broken, it feels like earthquake weather in here. Lee David used to fix most things around here until he started forgetting what was what. Thelma, he yells from the bedroom, which is primarily where he lives. Thelma is my name today. She was the girl Lee David was going to marry back in Abilene, but then Thelma, apparently attracted to the family genes, ran off to Shreveport with his brother. That's when Lee David turned to me, so I was not his first choice. But at 19, with no clear-cut plans, I skipped college in exchange for a chipped diamond ring and a chance to live in California. What you need, mister, that's what I call him face to face, to his face. Even though what I always hoped for was to have an opportunity to call him baby. I also hoped to feel my knees buckle when he touched me. Neither of these symptoms of love ever presented themselves to me while I was awake. In fact, I tried, but was never able to fall in love with Lee David, at least not the way I saw it happen in the movies or on A Young and the Restless. I never craved him, never felt like I couldn't live without him. I wanted to melt. I even prayed I'd feel like this one day, but when praying failed, I decided to just pretend Lee David was the man of my dreams. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I could sure use a straw for my tea, he says. Be right there. I open the white cabinet, the one with the loose brackets, and pull a straw out of the plastic glass I keep them in. The linoleum is soft in places because I can feel the nails pushing through my slippers. This house fell apart a long time ago. Everything in here is old, me and my husband. And right after I close the cabinet, I wonder, when is it too late to repair things when no one has bothered to give it the attention that it needs? Here you go, I say, and drop the straw into his diluted tea. It looks like midnight in this room, but I can still see the bags under his eyes, and the, uh, his eyes look three times bigger behind those bi bifocals. War has been his enemy, and the VA has joined them. They should help us get some help because I can't take care of him much longer by myself. Thank you, he says, without taking his eyes off the TV screen. Now he's watching Dora the Explorer like he does every day. I had to go out and buy the DVD because he would get upset when it went off. Now he just presses the remote to start it over. I'm learning how to speak Spanish, he said rather proudly after he got wind of the show. Perry como usta, senora. He's had dementia going on 10 years now, and sometimes I wish I had it too because Lee David doesn't seem to worry about too much of anything. Can I get you anything else? Why didn't you slide under the covers with me? You really do think I'm Thelma, don't you? I say, and walk out of the room. Dementia only affects him from the neck up, <laughs> which is why I hide those pills from him but he has his own stash. And even before he lost sight of things, I used to come into the bedroom like now in broad daylight 
and there he'd be lying there with a small tent in his lap and the stupidest grin on his face that made me want to gag. Sometimes I did it just to make that thing go down, but today I've got chicken to fry. <laughs> just this morning, oh, I'm sorry. When I hear the phone ring and I hear that ringtone, we don't need another hero, I say, to, yes, we do. I know it's my son, Quentin. I am not speaking to him, so I don't answer it. Because this morning, he called and said, and told me he was now a Mormon. You're a what? A member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Are you up there smoking those marijuana joints again? No, I told you I quit doing that almost three years ago, Ma. People always lie when you ask them if they're using drugs, Quentin, okay? I learned that from watching House. <laughs> I'm not lying to you, Ma. Look, Quentin, I am no expert on religion, but Mormons don't even like black people, do they? That's an old myth. What was wrong with being a Baptist? Nothing, really. I just feel closer to Jesus in this church. You sound like a damn fool, Quentin, and I'm going to hang, I'm going to go ahead and hang this phone up because every year you seem to find something different to believe in. I don't know where me and your daddy went wrong. Click, and I hung up. After all these years, I can't take these kind of sudden surprises. The truth be told, Quentin never, never has liked being black, which is why he lives up there in Mendocino with nothing but white folks. I sometimes wonder if he might be a homosexual since he has never brought a girl or a woman home for any of the major holidays. Not that I care, but... I'm too scared to ask him. You would at least think he'd offer to send me a few dollars since he knows I've been having a hard time ever since his daddy lost his mind and i am been fighting at VA to help take care of him, but no such luck. I am not one to ask for help because it's too much like begging, especially from somebody who gave birth to. Mama, where are you? Oh, Lord, not today. That voice belongs to Trinetta. She is 26, 27, I don't even know. She got three kids, and she should have never had any of them. Luther, some women should not have kids, and my daughter is one of them. Luther, whom she named, of course, after Luther Vandross, just turned eight. Ricky, who should be about five, both of whom were born with drug baby issues. Noxima's daddy, came, went to court, and got custody of her, so she's gone. Trinetta, unfortunately, never gave much thought to what it might take to be a mother, what was required of her to make their lives important. Their gift from her was her self-destruction. They were an intrusion, took up too much time. Trinetta isn't sure even who the other two daddies are. Excuse me. As they get older, I'll be able to tell, she said. Anyway, I'm back here in the kitchen, I say, and I hear the boys running over to shag carpet. Well, hello there, my little chocolate kisses. They were two different shades of brown, fudge and maple syrup, both cute in a peculiar way. Luther's forehead was big and his head on the square side. Ricky had features that coincided with each other, but his eyes seemed blank. It took a lot to make him laugh. Hello, Grandma Luther says. Ricky waves because his mother, as usual, cuts him off. Mama, Trinetta says in a tone I already know means she's about to ask for something she doesn't deserve. And those dreadlocks need to be cut off. I mean, I used to think people wore them because they had a sense of pride being black, but it had, but it had become obvious to me that it's just another hairstyle. Trinetta is also way too thin. Luther told me his mama smokes crack. Trinetta denies it. I don't have any crack money, she said over and over. And who are, you to who are you supposed to believe, a child or your grown daughter? How'd you get over here? And have the boys eaten, I ask. We took the bus. They, ate, they had cereal. What is it that brought you over here and without calling me first? I need to know if, I, if you can watch the boys for a couple of days. How many days is a couple? Three. Did you forget I have a job? You know how, you know, you know they are in school all day and an after school program. And just where might you be going this time? I might have a job opportunity. And it's gonna take you three days to get it? 
No, but I have to prepare myself. Prepare yourself how? And what kind of job is it? It's a sales position. And that's all I can tell you right now. I have to study for a test. Mm-hmm. Tell me another lie I can believe, Trinetta. I'm not lying this time, Ma. I cut, cut me a little slack, would you? Starting when? Today. Did you bring any clothes over here for the boys? I can drop them off later. And should we hold our breath? I thought they had some here. Of course they do. Is your cell phone working? It'll be back on tomorrow. I would really like to ask you a lot of things, but I am not going to bother. Good, Trinetta says, because I'm really not in the mood for a lecture. Is Daddy in his usual spot? He is. She walks over and sticks her head inside the doorway. Hey, Daddy, she says, but he doesn't answer. He is sound asleep or faking it. He hasn't had much to say to Trinetta ever since the first time she went to jail for selling Ill illegal products on eBay and Craigslist. And to think she got straight A's in high school and a scholarship to more than one University of California campus. Trinetta had bigger plans. She got a BA in sex and a master's degree in drugs. The boys sit out on the sofa as if they're waiting for something to happen. They are little, they are like little strangers. I look over their heads. That couch is still ugly that they're sitting on. It's a shade of gold I've never seen anywhere except in my house. And that fake brocade, those curvy wooden legs that broken four or five times, the boys did that from jumping on it. The coffee table in front of it is all wrong too and it was supposed to be tinted glass but now it's just dark. A film of dust lives on top of it. Nothing matches in this house. And I've not had, I've one, I've never had good taste and really never tried to do anything to improve it. But one thing I can say is it's clean. Say goodbye to your mama, boys. They do, and they do as they're told and seem anxious for her to hurry up and leave. Before I could say another word, Trinetta is out the door. When I turn my attention to the boys, they already look bored which means I'm going to have to entertain them or find something to occupy them. Crayons. Thank God I bought a new box and two coloring books the last time I was at the store. So what would you young men like to do today? Like to do? I would like to eat some, some more food, Ricky says. Me too, Luther says. I sure love, I love your fried chicken. How do you know that's fried chicken you smell? Everybody knows what fried chicken smells like. Come on back to the kitchen and I'll fix both of you a nice plate. And then, would you like to color? They both nod. All I'm thinking is, God, I sure wish I had taken my nap. Grandma, where are we gonna sleep? Luther asked. Hearing them talk like this is up there was scraping a fingernail on a chalkboard. It's where are we going to sleep? You can sleep in the room off the sun porch. Can we put on our new pajamas? that you always hide? Later, after your baths. How many days we staying over here this time? Luther asked. It's how many days are we staying over here? Three. But that three days would turn into five when I get a collect call, and I know what that means. And Trinetta says, Mama? And I said, where are you? And she said, in jail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys probably felt obligated to clap because I'm sitting here. <laughs> the title of the book, this, cha this chapter doesn't have a title. Um, or it's called Who Asked You? Oh, if you have a question, but I'm I'm writing it from uh, the little oh, the little boy's point of view, and Jewel and Tammy, because I always want to know what it feels like to be white. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but my question is more towards publishing.
publishing. So you started off the way a lot of other black authors did by self-publishing. And I wanted to know what your- Go ahead. Or correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I just wanted to know what your thought is on taking that route and um, how you were able to start from scratch and kind of build your empire. Build my what? Empire. <laughs> I don't have an empire. At any rate, somehow, some way, um, that information about me self-publishing was wrong. I don't know where that came from. I've never self-published. Houghton Mifflin published my first book. But, um, you know, I, I, I under, I'll put it this way, I have reservations about self-publishing. It's a racket right now. Um, these publishers will publish anybody. Most of the books are poorly edited, um, if at all, and it costs a fortune to pay them to publish your book. Um, I think that, to be honest with you, there are a lot of young writers out here are so hung up on being writers and so hung up on getting published, they do so at any cost. And, and you know, to me, it's, 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 it's not about that. Okay. I mean, if you're going to be a writer, you're going to write anyway, regardless of if you get published. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's hard times out here, as we know. Um, and publishers have cut back a lot. Um, and not just black writers, but a lot of writers in general. So I don't mean to sound discouraging, but you know, when I, when I first wrote my first novel, I never knew it was going to get published. I had no idea. Um, but I had to write it. And to me, it's, it's like an itch that you have to scratch. And um, you scratch it regardless um, you get more out of it than just publishing. Um, hopefully, you know, a lot of writers that I really respect and love, um, I just saw Martha Southgate in Brooklyn the other day. She wrote a novel, it's called The Taste of Salt. And um, I know her from way back, and I said, Martha, so how do you feel, do you feel differently after your, now that your book is published. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, are you, have you changed in any way? Do you have any beliefs that you balk at now that you don't, that anything that changed? And she says, I'm not real sure. Um, but I understand something else about people who live with people who are addicted to drugs. I said, well, there you have it. Um, if, if, I'll put it this way, my thing is, is that if, um, if I spend a year or however many hours a day laboring over other people's problems that are not necessarily my own and their lives, when I'm finished, I am a different person. And I don't think about, jeepers, is this going to be another bestseller? I wonder, you know, mm -mm. and I think unfortunately that's what a lot of a lot of young people just want to be published, and um, some of them are like 18 and 21, and unfortunately a lot of them don't even read. They just think that their lives are so interesting, and they want to be able to tell their story, and a lot of people don't understand our lives are not as interesting as we think they are, but. I suggest to you that you get an agent. That's really important. Never send your work directly to a publisher. And good luck. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Elise. And I have a question about the writing process. Do you have a set time uh, of day where you write, or do you wait for the inspiration to come to you and then you write? Everybody always asks that question. What difference does it make? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a I'm not trying to be funny. No, I'm in the process of writing, but I don't write every day. And sometimes I feel like maybe if I did. You have a job? Forward, I do. 
Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I had a baby, but um, I mean, the thing is, is that sometimes people think that this stuff rubs off. You know, it doesn't. Everybody has to find their own voice, their own way of working, whatever works for you. When I first started writing Mama, I had a nine-month-old baby. I was a single parent, and I worked four days a week, full time. And back then, I had a stolen IBM Selectric typewriter. Um, and I lived in Brooklyn. And I, I got up every morning at five o'clock and wrote until seven. I had his little bag pack for the babysitter, trudged through the snow, the rain, then got on the subway, edited on the subway at my job. I worked on my lunch hour and then printed it out and then edited it on the way home. And I did that for nine months, sometimes six days a week. Um, and that worked for me. But I'm a morning person. I'm a morning person, and I know a lot of people who are night people, who work at night. It's, it's, it's you have to find your own rhythm. But I will say this, it's better if you write something every day. I don't care if it's three sentences, because it's cum cumulative. And don't worry about it being bad or good. Don't look over your own shoulder and don't edit when you're supposed to be writing. You just feel what you write and write it. And don't worry if it's, write like you, like no one is ever going to read it, which should be obvious. <laughs> <laughs> now seriously, because you write from here and here, and then later you go back, and that's when you use this. Thank you. Last question or no? What time are we supposed to be leaving? Really? Oh, okay, Doki. One last question. Nobody from this side? I like these tents. Can I turn it into um, two questions? <laughs> two small questions. All right, first off, how do you feel about um, the e-books and how they're like kind of taking over in contrast, I guess, against the regular hardback or <coughs> paperback books okay. from the author standpoint? What's the other question? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm the other question is, what's the, the biggest thing that you say you have learned since you've become an author? Um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, basically to trust my heart. Um, because it doesn't lie. And also I think I have learned compassion and empathy. That's why I do it. Um, because I write about people that usually in real life would probably get on my nerves <laughs> or I would have very little patience for. And so those are the people that I write about so that I can, in fact, jump out of my own skin and stop thinking that the world revolves around me because I know it does not. And so in order to develop empathy, I put myself in their shoes and I put people in situations that may or may not, that I might not ever be in um, because I want to know how people deal with um, all kinds of issues um, and problems. And it works. It works. Ebooks, I mean, the bottom line is, is that, you know, they're here to stay. You know, as writers, we get our little royalties. Um, I personally don't like them. I like to tactile, I like to feel a book in my hands. And, um, I think they're good for airplanes, okay? And also, you know, I've had people that say, Ms. McMillan, can you sign my Kindle? And I say, no. Turn to the title page. You know, but I mean, the bottom line is, is I mean, I was saying this earlier that, you know, I have like over 900 CDs that I had someone scan for me. Um, and I always thought, you know, they were gonna be around forever. 
I can't even remember the last time I pushed a CD in my car. No, you can get a Ford Fusion that will record the, from music from the radio. You don't even have to, you don't need a CD. And for the most part, technology is changing everything, not, to, not just our jobs, but, you know, um, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, if I like them or not. I just pray that bookstores never become extinct. And especially independent bookstores. No offense to Barnes and Noble, but but thank you everybody very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.